It's been just a few days since Peter McKay and Aaron O'Toole leapt into the conservative leadership race, but they wasted no time clarifying their positions on gay pride parades, an issue that proved problematic for outgoing leader Andrew Scheer during the election campaign. On Twitter, McKay announced that he'll march in Toronto's Pride Parade this June and invited all Conservatives to join him. Aaron O'Toole says he will march in Pride Parades in general, but not Toronto since it excludes uniform police officers. This is all on the heels of their fellow candidate, Richard Descari, drawing condemnation for saying being gay is a choice. There have been calls ever since to remove Descari from the race. Would the party consider it? Dan Nolan is the co-chair of the organizing Committee for the Conservative Leadership Race and joins us from Toronto. Hi, Mr. Nolan. Hi, Vashi. Before we get into the ins and outs and the rules of this race, can I ask you for an update on how many people are officially registered to run? Uh, well, yeah, we have no official uh, candidates uh, yet. Uh, we are working through the approval process on a couple of candidates uh, right now, and uh, we hope to get that out as quickly as we can. Okay, let's start there then. What does that approval process look like? So someone submits their, I think it's $25,000 to start, plus their uh, their forms, what then happens? Sure, uh, so yeah, the, the, you're right. There's the $25,000 uh, of the fee, uh, the non-refundable fee. Uh, there's a thousand signatures from active party members. And then there's uh, there's the forms. And the forms are pretty extensive. There's an extensive questionnaire that's about, runs about 45 pages. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's an extensive process and that's reviewed by, so our leadership committee has uh, several subcommittees and one of those subcommittees is uh, to review the, the candidates themselves when they come forward and, and have all their documents and all the signatures. So this is, um, it, um, would I be accurate in describing it as a vetting process? Uh, yeah, that's right. Okay, and so it's this subcommittee that essentially vets the candidates once they have put in their paper and submitted their first 25 grand? That's correct. And is there a time, like, are you not going to let anybody know till the end of March if they've been approved, or will they know very quickly? No, we need to let them know as soon as they get through the process if they are approved, because that allows them, via Elections Canada rules, to be official candidates, which means then they can officially raise money, they can open bank accounts, they can do all the stuff they need to do to be able to, to run a, a campaign. And can you tell me a bit about what the committee or how the, that sub, subcommittee will be deciding who can and can't run? What kind of kinds of things are they going to be considering? Uh, well, you know, for example, you'd consider the, uh, the one of the issues there is is uh, testing that you're a conservative, that you agree with conservative party uh, philosophies, and and that's one of the things there. But the the it's as I said, it's a 45-page document, so it, it covers about everything you could think about. Um, and, that's uh, the questionnaire you're referring to? Yeah, that's right. Okay. That's right. Does it ask any, and I mean, I'm asking obviously because of the, the controversy surrounding those comments last week mm -hmm. from Mr. Descari, does it ask, for example, do you believe being gay is a choice? It doesn't, it doesn't go into any, any types of specifics that way, but I would, I would say that uh, that's, those types of issues are, are more addressed when you have to attest that you agree with the Conservative Party of Canada's philosophies. And what is the Conservative Party of Canada's philosophy where something like that is concerned? Well, uh, you know, again, I, I think generally speaking, you know, the Conservative Party is, uh, you know, has made a point repeatedly and I think has done a good job at doing this of, of uh, making sure that we, we all uh, agree with uh, fundamental human rights, that everybody's equal, that everybody has an equal chance to, to uh, be successful in this country and everybody should have, you know, th there shouldn't be any question of people's equality. Is there any explicit question on the questionnaire about sexuality, though? Uh, no. There isn't. Do you think that that might be a problem given the comments made last week? Like, is there a, is there sort of a, I take your point on, on what those, the sort of the, the value of equality is, but is there a lens through which those kinds of comments can be uh, evaluated by that subcommittee? Yeah, I mean, maybe I should clarify something. I mean, the, the committee's job, and we had, obviously we had 17 candidates last time right. around going through roughly the same process. So we weren't trying, the, the purpose of the committee is not to exclude people. So fundamentally, um, unless somebody does something that's disqualifying, uh, you know, generally speaking, I think conservatives want the members to have the right to decide who should be the who should lead the party. So I think that's the fundamental thesis. Uh, that being said, we do have this vetting process, and if if there were a candidate who had done or said or behaved in a way that was disqualifying, then that would be uh, that would be something that uh, that the committee would consider. I don't think Mr. Dickery's candidacy is before you yet. You can correct me if I'm wrong. But that's right. It's not. Okay, it's not. Based on what you've heard so far, does saying something like that is that disqualifying? 
Well, again, I, I'm not going to, you know, it, it's not my decision. It's the committee's decision, and, and uh, we haven't had any dialogue about it whatsoever. We don't have a process that would address people who are potential candidates. Um, I, I can say we have, um, the last I checked, if you looked at uh, Facebook and social media and actual media, there's something like 11 or 12 people who've said that they're interested in running for the leadership, so we haven't vetted any of those who haven't come forward with documentation. How is that subcommittee constituted? Like, is it is it a cross-section of members? Is it people it's from... A, it's a subset of, of the okay. leadership election committee. And how many people sit on that committee? Uh, nine. Nine people. And is there... Um, I guess, do you have a, I know you don't, I know you're, you're here in your capacity as the, you know, in your capacity on the leadership committee as the head of this whole process, but mm -hmm. do you have an opinion on what happened uh, with Mr. Day Curry and what he said? I mean, there is a debate between, for example, even members of parliament in your party about whether or not he should be allowed to run. There's a conversation about free speech versus bigotry. What, do you have a, like a sense of how you feel about it? Sure. Uh, look, I got a good sense of it last Friday because uh, my co-chair and I, Lisa Raitt, were in front of National Caucus okay. uh, on Friday, and we got a good sense of where uh, the diversity of opinions uh, that sit uh, that sit um, that sit in caucus. So we got a good good view of that. So you know the diversity of opinions, but you you don't want to talk about your own. Well, I mean, it's not really my place. It's it's a bit like watching a sports game. I don't think you want the referees to be the interesting part of the game. It should be the players on the field, and we're we're not trying to interfere in the process. We want to have a level, uh, transparent playing field for everyone to have a good shot. So, are you going to be telling candidates? And just so I'm clear on the the timeline again, so they'll submit uh, this their their stuff. They'll get uh, vetted, and then at, is it sort of like a, a a moving ball as to when you let people know? Like, will it be? I'm just trying to get a sense of how will the public know whether or not Mr. Dickery is accepted as a candidate? Uh, well, you know, we would confirm um, we, we would confirm with the candidate after it goes through the entire vetting process and we let, um, first of all, the, the, the members from the leadership election committee who are not sitting on the nominating committee know, uh, we would let our national party's national council know, and uh, then uh, we would let the candidate and elections candidate know that they're, uh, they're an official candidate. I'm presuming that the candidates would find every advantage in, in <laughs> announcing that as quickly as they could. So. Gotcha. Before I let you go, one final question on the kinds of, uh, the kinds of considerations that that committee will look like, will, will be looking at. Does language or bilingualism factor into any of it? Um, yeah, I mean, a anything that's top of mind is the kind of thing that's fair ball for the committee to ask a candidate, potential candidate about, and, and that certainly is the kind of thing that, um, that would be asked. Okay, is it on the questionnaire, or is it just something the committee might ask? No, it's just something the committee might ask. Okay, okay, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Mr. Nolan. Appreciate okay. your time, as always. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Dan Nolan, co-chair of the Conservative Party's Leadership Election Organizing Committee. Today's latest developments on the conservative leadership race involve pride parades. Peter McKay tweeted that pride parades rather are important and added, we live in a world where sexual orientation and gender identity are still used by tyrants and bigots to belittle and oppress. Today, I am submitting my application to march in Toronto's pride parade on June 28th. I hope all conservatives will consider joining me. Aaron O'Toole initially told a Calgary gathering last night he would walk in Pride to parades. Today, he added a condition on that, stating, I will not participate in the Toronto Pride Parade while its policy is to exclude Canadians, especially uniformed police officers. Its regrettable position is incompatible with the principles of inclusivity and the equality of all Canadians. O'Toole said he would march in Toronto's Pride Parade when it becomes, quote, truly inclusive. Marika, I'm going to start with you. Actually, sorry, I haven't even introduced the power <laughs> panel yet. My apologies. In Vancouver, we're joined by former Conservative Cabinet Minister Stockwell Day. In Toronto, Tim Murphy, Managing Director of McMillan Vantage, alongside Marcella Monroe, Principal at WPM Public Affairs, and Marika Walsh, as I got ahead of myself, <laughs> from the Globe and Mail, sitting right next to me here in studio. Hi, everyone. Hello. Uh, Marika, so I, as I mentioned, I will start with you. Uh, let's talk a bit about the, the, the framing of the context around this. This is obviously, it was an issue for Andrew Scheer. This question about pride parades became a very sticky one for him, both during the election mm -hmm. and even after. Um, uh, tell me a bit about why we're seeing these kinds of statements so early on in this campaign? Yeah, so I think the backdrop is really important, both because people perceived Mr. Shear's comments to raise questions more broadly about his viewpoints on LGBTQ rights. I think that was really the root of the matter there, that how he spoke about same-sex marriage and pride parades led to other questions. And then, of course, last week, we saw these comments from a prospective candidate who's not official yet, Richard Dicurie, who says, who said, excuse me, that um, he thought being gay was a choice. So I think that is forcing these other candidates to come out 
faster on this, but I think certainly they want to put these issues to bed as soon as possible because of the challenges it's, it's posed for the party in the last few months. What do these statements say to you, Marcella? Uh, well, first of all, I love Pride, and I've been marching Pride Parade since about 1993, I think. So um, I would uh, offer my services if any conservative wants some uh, help in getting dressed for a Pride Parade. I'd love to uh, do that. It's fun. Um, look, I think they do. Uh, they are trying to, out of the gate, kind of uh, take care of, of this issue. Uh, I think it was uh, and remains a problem for the Conservative Party, uh, for Canadians to be questioning whether or not uh, they accept uh, LGBTQ rights, and although I think the vast majority of conservatives and conservative voters do, uh, there was doubt left in people's minds, so you need to deal with that. Um, uh, so I, I think it's probably smart for the front runners to do it. I'm a little bit um, stunned, and maybe we'll see a turn on this, because I think both of these, uh, both of the quote-unquote lead, lead, leaders in the leadership contest so far, if they want to reach out to social conservative voters that are party members, there are many other issues you can talk to them about, whether it's school choice, uh, how you handle child care, poverty alleviation, the opioid crisis. So, you know, issues where I wouldn't agree with them, but they wouldn't be so inflammatory, I don't think, to hear for other Canadians to hear that part of the discussion. And so I'm waiting for them to maybe turn uh, to some of those other issues because they will need to reach out to some of those voters at some point. Stockwell, from a political perspective, I think both Marcella and Marika have touched on it, just sort of getting this out of the way early in on and then maybe like Marcella highlights, there will be outreach in, in other areas. Is that smart politics? I think it is. I had the privilege of speaking to the Tory caucus uh, on Friday, and I can tell you not one MP there, and certainly none, even when I was uh, serving in that caucus, ever suggested in any way that there would be taking away of anybody's constitutional rights, and that includes those constitutionally protected rights regarding sexual orientation. That was not an issue. What I think is, uh, you know, parades down through history have been used to either make political statements or just for people to have fun. And uh, I, I'm a bit, I guess, apprehensive when parades start to become litmus tests. I would, I would rue the day when, let's say, a, a, a Jewish leader, a person who's a leader of a Canadian party, who happened to be Jewish, would uh, her loyalty would be questioned to human rights if she didn't march in a Christian Easter parade, which obviously uh, upholds uh, Jesus Christ as Messiah, which the Jewish community doesn't. And for that to be used as some kind of lit litmus test, if it, if it evolves to that kind of thing, I'm really worried about that. So I think let people have their parades. I think Aaron uh, O'Toole makes an interesting point about the, uh, the Pride Parade is not as maybe inclusive as um, they could or should be. So that's a point to be debated. But on this issue of defending the constitutional rights of every Canadian, that there is no question about that uh, in, in the Tory caucus and of all the MPs that I know. It is interesting, uh, Tim, the idea of, uh, of these parades as litmus tests. It kind of became that way during the campaign. I don't know if it would necessarily apply to these candidates in the same way, but it came that way during the campaign, I think because there were so many questions raised by, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Andrew Shear's answers, right, or, or lack thereof. All of a sudden it became, like, that could be another way to exemplify his hesitancy where those issues are concerned. I take Stockwell's point that much of the caucus is obviously not like that, and I, that's why I'm saying I don't know if this would have been the same kind of litmus test for these candidates, but clearly they felt like it might be. Yeah, although I have to say I thought Stock's answer kind of went in a weird direction fast because I think actually the core issue was uh, fundamentally about tolerance versus celebration, I think. And I think, you know, frankly, there's still a risk of it going weird inside the Tory caucus on that issue. And, and I think kind of what you're hearing from most Canadians is, look, kind of we are going to have a constitutional protected right is one thing. But the notion that we celebrate, you know, love, diversity, the willingness of people to choose who they want to love uh, it, and celebrate that difference is what the parade, for example, is a symbol of. And it's not just we tolerate, they've got the rights at law. And I think, you know, Andrew Scheer fell into that trap. And uh, so let me say, though, to, you know, progress on this issue, even in baby steps, is a good thing. So credit to both McKay and Aaron O'Toole for moving the yardsticks within the Tory party. We still have to see if the Tory party is prepared to let them. And I think, you know, O'Toole's kind of little tweak around the participation of police officers suggests there's still some way to go. Marika? Marilyn Gladue is also saying that she would march in the parades. I think it's interesting to note that O'Toole, who also in his launch video and in his statements yesterday, 
really is trying to position himself further to the right of Peter McKay is the one to be saying that that this has to happen with with the police involved. It's the similar position that Ontario Premier Doug Ford also takes. So there is some precedence among the conservative movement for that. Um, but I think that the point about pride parades, and I think something that some people thought was missing from Andrew Shear's understanding of it, is that actually LGBTQ people are still marginalized and do mm -hmm. still face discrimination, and that they do not have full access in the way that non-LGBTQ members may have in the community to healthcare services, to other issues. So they do still see this parade as a march for rights that they do not have. And I think one of the interesting things in the Conservative Party of, from the people that I've been speaking with in the last week has been this discussion about rights, that they all say they're in favor of rights, but there is a question then about what rights are we talking about? How are you defining these rights? Because it's easy to say you're in favor of all human rights and, and the rights of all Canadians, but then I think people are understanding it or explaining it to themselves differently. I think there's not agreement on what that actually means. Stockwell, what do you think about that? Um, well, first of all, as a defender of human rights and constitutional rights, um, if somebody, if I had a constituent uh, come to me who was a member of the gay community and said that they were being denied some kind of health services or anything like that, I would be going after that with vigor. So um, to, my, to my understanding of where things have, have gone the last even 30 years is this issue of being denied rights um, has moved, I think advanced quite positively. I don't hear that a lot. I was an MP for quite a number of years and I would have gone after that, uh, as I said, with real intensity. I mean, I, but I, I hear the same thing, let's say, from the Christian community. They say that they are denied certain rights, for instance, on uh, having to sign declarations before their, their uh, um, operations for students can get money and things like that. So, you know, often there are people who say we are denied rights. So let's take it on a case-by-case -case basis and look at it. I, I don't think, uh, I think either in the Christian community or the gay community or the Muslim community, I think we can still boast around the world that we are probably world leaders in terms of enjoying freedom of rights. It's not to say we shouldn't be vigilant, we should. And uh, let, let's look at it that way and treat everybody equally under the Constitution. Marcella? Well, I think it's really interesting to bring religion into this. I mean, I don't actually think there's a parallel uh, there. Uh, but I would say this, I would say there isn't really a Canadian politician that I think would have a problem um, going to Visaki Festival, for example. Um, I think that that's widely accepted that that when you want to show uh, that you are uh, in touch with the South Asian community and that you respect the culture and you like to celebrate with them that you will attend Visaki. And I think that the Pride Parade is it's much more parallel to that because it's not so much, you know, it is about rights. We know that there's uh, still a lot of problems, uh, especially in smaller communities uh, where uh, young gay, lesbian, bisexual, trans uh, people uh, will be harassed and still face many challenges and problems. That's why the GSAs are so important. The GSA issue in Alberta Alberta uh, is still a little bit hotly contested in some quarters there. Trans people uh, still have uh, very big access problems to health across the country. So there are serious issues facing the gay, lesbian, bisexual, trans community. Uh, and I also, but I think this is a litmus test in a way because, um, you know, there are parades that no one bats an eye about uh, celebrating at. So what is it that stops people from wanting to go? And by the way, I don't really think it's appropriate. Like, it's fine to raise your concerns about the police not being able to march in a parade, but that decision's made by the community, not by those of us that want to show our support. Last word to you, Tim. Yeah, so I mean, well, I, I, I agree with Marcella, and I think it's interesting when you look, like there's still some way to go. You look back in the past of some of these politicians, Peter McKay, for all of the fancy words, voted against the bill on transgender rights and equality uh, when he was still a member of parliament uh, some years ago. And to be fair to Aaron O'Toole, he voted in favor of it at that point in time. But I do think it is I mean, I think there, there was a discussion about, uh, I, I think even with Andrew Scheer, right? Like during that time when they put the video out, people were saying, well, Ralph Goodale voted uh, the same way. And then he had to come out and say, here's how I've evolved. And Andrew Scheer could never really, uh, could never really define that. He couldn't say that. So, I mean... Oh, he I, might be able to say how he's evolved, agree. He, he should be asked, you're right. Yeah, which is what I was, yeah, there are questions that need to be answered. That does, look, I, I think there's room for people to evolve on this issue, but there is a standard they need to get to, and it's more than just tolerance. I think it needs to be celebration and a vigorous pursuit of, of uh, the elimination of barriers, and we'll see if the Conservative Party can get there. Okay, I'm going to take Tim a Shirt, Tim Shirty wouldn't point. suggest I could say to it. I could say to an atheist, "You better show up in that Christian parade that I'm involved in. You better celebrate 
my belief in God and an atheist going, whoa, sorry, you know, I just can't do that, but I'm it's sure. It's a little bit of an apples to oranges. A little yeah. bit of an apples to oranges yeah. comparison. But we no, all, no, we, you're talking about celebration. Uh, I, I don't think I have the right to impose upon someone. You better come and celebrate my Christian faith with me, or but I no, doubt your respect is saying, for Nobody humanity. is saying you better. They've just said, you know, will you? And now they've get, provided some answers. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.